Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. This is Susan Ryan. I am the Senior Director for the Greenhouse Project. I'm delighted that you've chosen to spend the next hour with us. I'm especially delighted for our speaker today and even more so the topic. Before we go there, I'm going to remind you that you are in listen-only mode. That means that all phone lines are muted. And if you need to communicate with the organizer, you can do that via the chat box. In addition to that, I want to let you know that there will be a video link and a survey that will be sent out to you. The survey comes approximately two hours after the end of this webinar today, and then you will get a link to today's webinar um, either today or tomorrow. So let's talk about memory care deconstructed and what exactly that means. In some ways, I would say this is a rather provocative topic, and I can't wait to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Jennifer Carson. And I, Jennifer and I were just talking, trying to remember when we first met. It was through Dr. Al Power in Rochester, New York. And I, it's probably been six years or so ago. And I found the kindred spirit in um, Jennifer when we met. And certainly we were in good company with Dr. Al Power. So let me tell you a little bit about Jennifer. And I'm gonna read just the first statement in her bio, which I found fascinating. Dr. Jennifer Carson works to envision and develop opportunities for individual and collective growth to combat ageism and to improve the inclusion and well-being of elders with a particular interest in persons living with dementia. I think that's powerful. And I think Jennifer is well qualified to speak on the topic. Um, she has a broad range of degrees and experiences. Her background includes a BA in therapeutic recreation from Eastern Washington University, an MS in therapeutic rec from Clemson University, and now a PhD in recreation and le leisure studies, aging and health and well-being program from the University of Waterloo. It was in that context of kind of meaningfully engaging and reframing what does it mean to meaningfully engage a person living with dementia and to, to really see them and engage with them person to person that I met Jennifer. Um, I'm excited for her to talk about this topic today and I'm gonna just get out of the way, Jennifer, and let you get started. So excited to read this. Thank you, Susan, and thank you so much for the opportunity to explore this topic. Um, with folks who are a part of the Greenhouse Project and nationally. Uh, it, it is such an important topic for exploration. Uh, increasingly, um, locked and segregated memory care is really being challenged, uh, especially by people who are living with dementia, who are demanding their human rights and the freedom to live in a restraint-free world. And it's interesting because as a field, um, we've done a really great job um, of fighting against chemical restraints and um, physical restraints. Um, but locked doors, locked doors are also a restraint. They're an environmental restraint. And so as the, a field um, committed to the restraint-free movement, um, this is the next step, I believe, in, in that good fight. And, and so as a field, we're really being called to create inclusive communities for people of all abilities, people of all abilities, including people living with dementia. And so I'm really grateful for this opportunity to explore this topic. Um, the time for change is now, I really believe. Uh, let me, oops, for some reason my slide is not advancing. Let me um, play with my technology a little here. There we go. So, so today um, is part one of a two-part series, and today we're going to explore the case for inclusive living, including the moral, clinical, evidence-based, and demographic arguments. So today is really an opportunity for all of us to reflect 
on the practice of, of memory care and um, to explore some of these arguments. Um, and then next time we get together um, on February 12th next week, we have part two where we're gonna really consider practical pathways to inclusion. And we're gonna highlight some practice-based examples from provider communities that are really making strides and leading the way. And I'm really excited in part two, I get to share some of my most recent research um, that I've been working with a, a group in North Carolina called Carol Woods Retirement Community. Um, they've been an inclusive continuing care retirement community since they opened their doors. They have 500 residents. And a big part of my research there was being able to understand how they do that. How do they support the needs of people living with dementia on a campus with 500 elders without a single locked door? Um, and so we're gonna um, ch chat about uh, my, my work at Carroll Woods and also some other providers um, across the nation that are really leading the way on a pathway to inclusion. There we go. Sorry, there must be a little delay on my slide advance. So um, sorry about these transitions being a little slow. Um, but I, I wanna start with this photo. Um, has this ever happened to you? I'm not sure how many folks on the webinar today are providers of memory care. Um, I am a former memory care provider. Um, as recently as just three years ago, um, I worked for a uh, segregated memory care provider and I actually helped open the very first standalone memory care community in Washington state. Um, so I have a, a long history of working in the field. Um, I think it's important to put that right out there. Um, and yes, this has happened to me. This is not a photo that I took. Um, this I believe is a stock photo, um, but I have had this experience where an elder who came to live um, against uh, her will, um, it, it came to live in the memory care community where I, I worked. Um, when she couldn't get out the door, she kicked out the screen and uh, jumped out the window. Um, in her case, um, it, fortunately, it was a first floor window, um, but in her case, unfortunately, uh, it was a window to a locked courtyard, um, so it didn't really do her much good. Um, but I have to admit that my heart broke um, completely when I saw this woman um, so desperate to leave this memory care community where I worked. And, and I had worked so hard to create such a wonderful community, um, a, a supportive community for people living with dementia. Um, and so I, I felt really bad about the situation. She really didn't want to be in this wonderful environment that we had created. Um, she was exercising um, her self-determination to try to leave. Um, she was ultimately not successful. And that day, I went home from work um, and I really had a moral residue on my heart. And uh, because I felt really conflicted about locking adults into this memory care community uh, against their will. And I have to admit that um, I've worked in the field of memory care and support for over 20 years. And uh, that moral residue I think I carried with me um, until today. And so this is this has absolutely happened to me. And so today, um, it's an opportunity for all of us to reflect on this practice, um, a practice that at one time we considered a best practice, and, um, and it probably was. You know, when I opened the first memory care community in Washington State back in the 90s, uh, it was a far cry better than the alternative for people living with dementia, um, which at that time was really a, a locked dementia care unit in a nursing home. And so I was very proud to open the first memory care community in Washington state. Um, but uh, today I, I, I'd like to take the knowledge that I've learned over those years and apply it to supporting people living with dementia in inclusive communities. So today we're, I'm gonna invite all of you to be a part of this reflection. I know it's difficult. Know that um, I'm right there with you. <laughs> um, 
and I'm going to share some arguments um, so that we can consider the, the case for inclusive living, or I guess you can also say it's a case against locked and segregated memory care. Um, I'm not a, a legal or, or policy expert. I, I'm just a curious gerontologist and also a family care partner of a person who is living with dementia, and I have a lot of questions. And I'm just trying to live and work with my whole heart. And if you're working and living with your whole heart, then you know that that there are times um, that that your your reflections are going to cause a little bit of tension or even pain. And um, and and that's where I am right now with this topic, um, with this subject, um, recognizing that I feel like I played a role in helping to create memory care. Um, so um, today I'm going to use those same great intentions that I had 20 some years ago, and, and I'm going to use them for some critical reflection on the subject. And so hopefully we're going to save some time at the end um, for some Q&A um, with Susan and myself and open it up for some other discussion. This photo um, is not a stock photo. It's a really difficult photo to look at. It was taken by a good friend of mine. Uh, his name is Matt Perry, and uh, he's a journalist, and he had a blog that was part of the California Health Report um, in the past, and you can read um, his blog. Um, there's a, the address at the bottom of this page, but this is a photo that Matt took um, a month before his mother's death in a memory care community on the East Coast. Um, today, Matt and I work together in the Dementia Friendly and Inclusive Initiative because like myself, Matt and his experience with memory care has caused some uh, critical self-reflection. And um, today, he would like to create a better future for people living with dementia than his mother had. And um, as part of Matt's blog, he wrote this. He said, is it any wonder that my mother was rattling her cage, warehoused in a system that rarely meets the physical needs of residents while almost completely neglecting their emotional and spiritual desires, not to mention their sensual ones. We are on the precipice of disaster, and we can either follow the visionaries who seek to redefine aging, or we can continue to treat and imprison our parents and our grandparents in their bodies and our facilities. It's such a, a painful photo um, that Matt took, and I'm so grateful um, for um, his blog and that he was willing to share this reflection and uh, and he says that he wished there were better alternatives. Um, today, Matt is part of the Dementia Inclusive movement, seeking to create better alternatives, more inclusive alternatives for people who are living in memory care. Um, I have not. I'm not one of those naturally enlightened people <laughs> like some of my teachers. Um, I have come to this place of questioning memory care um, over many years of reflection. Um, I didn't start here. Um, I'm really grateful. These are some of my teachers on this slide, people who have taught me to really question the status quo of memory care and locked doors. Uh, my partners at Carol Woods Retirement Community that I get to share uh, more about their journey um, in part two. Of course, Dr. Al Power, who is a, a dear friend of both the Greenhouse Project and, and, and my dear friend, and, um, and also a collaborator. Uh, Al and I are currently writing a, a book on the subject. Um, it's due in August, which is kind of a terrifying deadline, <laughs> but, um, but I'm really grateful to Al um, for all of our numerous conversations and um, collaborations on the subject of segregation and inclusion. I'd like to really acknowledge two teachers, um, Phyllis Fair and Kate Swaffer, both experts of lived experience. Um, Phyllis and I have presented on this subject before, and um, she's a tremendous self-advocate, former board member of Dementia Alliance International. And I just have to share that um, Phyllis and I were doing a panel on the subject at a Canadian culture change conference called Walk With Me. I was the facilitator of the panel, and um, Phyllis was one of the panelists and I was really excited and, and we had worked 
over a couple of months to really um, prepare our session together. And three days um, before our panel discussion, um, Phyllis's son tragically died. And Phyllis came to the panel and she said to me, Jennifer, I need to let you know something. Um, my son, um, my son has tragically died and um, and I need to leave immediately after the panel because I, I need to go make arrangements for his funeral. And I, um, I mean, I was stunned, um, shocked. I, I honestly wasn't exactly sure to say, um, you know, of course, um, how sorry I was and to tell Phyllis that she was under absolutely no obligation to continue with this panel discussion on dementia inclusion that I would totally understand. It, you know, this is horrible that she, you know, for her to take the time and I mean, to go and, and take care of this family emergency, this horrible tragedy. And Phyllis said, no, Jennifer, I'm not going to miss this panel. I'm not going to miss it because it's too important. We have to talk about this. And um, Phyllis uh, was such a brave um, champion advocating for the rights of people living with dementia despite her incredible grief. And, uh, and she gave this powerful, um, this powerful argument against the village model um, of segregated uh, memory care. And, and really encouraged people to think critically and to not mistake the beauty of the structure um, because it's still a form of segregation, as Phyllis said. And so thank you to Phyllis for her bravery and her courage and her advocacy. And to Kate Swaffer, who many of you um, may have read Kate's work. She publishes quite a bit. And uh, recently she, she and partners published a great article um, called Questioning Segregation of People living with dementia in Australia, an international human rights approach to care homes. And I just, I wanna share a quote from um, Kate out of this article. Um, Kate is, is such a powerful advocate. And, um, and as the chair and CEO of DAI, um, this is what Kate has written. She says, we know institutional care ensured worst case for orphans, and people with disabilities, and we moved away from that style of assisted living many years ago. DAI is campaigning globally to phase out institutional care in locked units. And then she added, uh, people living with dementia want freedom in care homes, and that locking us away based on us having an illness is not only a form of segregation, it is a serious breach of human rights. So thank you to Kate for opening my eyes. Um, thank you for your powerful advocacy. Another of my teachers is my husband, uh, Dr. Peter Reed, um, director of the Stanford Center for Aging here at UNR, where I also serve on faculty. And um, Peter, both professionally and personally, um, has, has really helped me learn and to reflect on this subject. Um, we talk about this a lot at home at our kitchen table. Um, because my dad is living with dementia. One of my dads, I have three dads. Um, one is is living with dementia. And so this is not just um, an academic curiosity for me. Um, this is personal. This is, this is really personal. And um, so I'm grateful to my husband for all of our conversations on this subject and as well my, as my dad and my brother. Um, who have really been my teachers as my family looks for ways to really support my dad's autonomy and freedom and right to choose housing where he wants to live. And then finally, uh, many of my teachers have been people living with dementia that I have locked in memory care. And today I publicly apologize. Um, I am truly and deeply sorry. And uh, I take solace in the words of Maya Angelou, who said, I did then what I knew how to do. And now that I know better, I, I do better. He did, this, is, um, this is a difficult subject, folks, and, and I am not here to cast judgment um, on any memory care providers. Um, there's no judgment, um, at least not for me. What I understand is that we are good people we have the best of intentions, but thankfully, we also have evolving knowledge. And so as we have continued to learn more 
and more about humane um, and dignified approaches to dementia care and support, relational approaches to care and support. Let's use that knowledge to really support the rights of the people that we support. Um, so no judgment, folks. Um, so with that, let's reflect a little bit on the experience of segregation for people who are, are living with dementia. Um, this is a little bit, uh, this is my journey. These are some of my reflections. Um, having been a memory care provider for a long time prior to going back to graduate school, um, when it came time for me to do my master's thesis, I, I thought, oh, I'm going to do a, an ethnography of residential dementia care and really try to understand the culture um, and experience of being a resident on a, a memory care unit in, in assisted living. And so um, if you know about ethnography, um, you know, it's like it's a cultural um, research approach. I, I really wanted to understand the culture um, of the residents. And so I had my tape recorder going, you know, all the time that I was there and it just captured um, discussions as they occurred naturally within the context. And um, a number of those discussions that my tape recorder captured really caused a lot of reflection for me. And this is a, a, a little citation from um, a transcript that demonstrates how people in memory care want out. And so this was Thomas, a resident and a care partner. And Thomas says, you know, he's pointing to the keypad on the door and he says, hey, what's the number? And the care partner says, well, what number? He's like, duh, like this one, right? And the care partner says, oh, no, 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 no. But I'll tell you what I will do. And Thomas very, uh, you know, suspiciously, honestly said, what? And the care partner said, well, you can go outside anytime you want to. You just have to take one of us with you. You just have to have one of us take you. You can go out there and you can walk as long as we're with you, okay? And Thomas, you know, he did not believe this at all. He says, what, what, when? And the care partner said, well, when you want to go, we can take you out and we can let you walk around if you want to. Isn't that horrible? The word let. Oh, anyway, so Thomas um, was super frustrated and says, ah, you know, he was really upset um, by the care partner's response. And the care partner again said, no, no, seriously, we can take you out there um, if you want to. But no one around here can know the code. That's just what our boss tells us. Well, Thomas was very upset at this point, and he just went back to his room, shut the door, didn't see Thomas again for quite a while. Um, wow, this is not an uncommon dialogue. I can't even count how many times I've had this discussion with residents in memory care communities where I've worked, and those of you who are also on this webinar, um, think about how many times you've had this discussion, and what do we say? And when people know, that they're locked in. So sometimes this locked door creates confusion because people, they don't feel like that they're they're necessarily wanting out of something they're locked in. They feel like they, they're locked out of something they want in. So the, the locked door can create a lot of confusion. This was a resident named Laverne and she, um, she was tapping on the door. Again, this is the community where I was doing my ethnographic research and she's She's trying to, she's pushing on the metal bar. She's trying to get through the door and she, now she's talking into the door, talking into the door because she believes her husband is injured and lying on the other side of a door that she can't open. And Laverne's saying, are you okay? And she's, she's crying. And she's saying, I love you, darling. I love you. You know it. Please open the door. And she's pushing on the bar. And she's saying, please answer me please answer me, honey. Gosh, can't you just make a little noise of some kind? Just a little noise, pick up something to make a little bit of noise. And then she sees me and, and she turns to me. She says, oh, please help me. Please help me. Wow. Now, I wish I could tell you that my response was enlightened and relationship-centered and um, I, I wish I could tell you I was able to help Laverne um, to ease her distress. Um, I wasn't, and that's the thing. When you um, audio record your conversations, you learn about all of these opportunities to do better when you play it back. Um, yeah, what was I, you know, what, what, what can you say? They want out. I tried to assure her that her husband was not lying on the other side of the door. Um, 
but I didn't give her the answer that she was looking for. And she actually turned down the hall and she just screamed. Um, she said, I want to know if he's alive. She screamed it down the hall. Can anybody tell me if he's alive? It was horrible. It was horrible. Um, so some people want in places that they feel locked out of. This is a study that was done um, by some folks that were a part of my uh, doctoral committee up in Canada. Um, Christine Jonas Simpson and Gail Mitchell, I worked as a graduate assistant for them. And this was a study that they did up in Canada. And I took this quote because it just really helps, helps me understand how, how much people want and deserve freedom. Um, they write in their study, one participant exclaimed that he went to war to free Canada and now he's locked up in Canada. He described the importance of freedom to him. He said, the most important thing is I want to be free. I was never tied up and I hate people who lock me up. I lose a day every day that I am held in here. I lose a day of my life. I want freedom. I want freedom. Here's a veteran, a veteran of Canada, locked in memory care. There was another study um, done back in 1992. You know, this was interesting. While I was busy trying to build memory care or, or thinking about memory care, um, there was a wonderful study um, that was trying to help the world understand how important autonomy is for people living with dementia and the potential damage of locked doors. Um, I am sad that I didn't come across this article until just recently. Um, but here's some quotes from their 1992 study that I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. But they said, you know, whenever freedom of choice is limited, residents are found to have lower levels of self-esteem and psychological well-being. Well, this makes sense, right? They also wrote, residents often became aggravated with their inability to open doors and were perplexed by being detained in this building. One resident told a caregiver very succinctly, I have never had so much trouble going outside. This sense of confinement felt by many residents is carried over into other observable behaviors throughout the day, such as verbal outbursts, aimless wandering, or pacing from one exit door to another. I want you to imagine for a moment that you are renting an apartment somewhere and that your landlord locks you into that apartment. And when you demand to be let out, the landlord says, sorry, your family had some concerns. <laughs> and, and so they, they're doing this for your safety. And imagine one step further, imagine you call the, the police and, 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 and even the police, um, they're, they're really swayed by the arguments of your landlord and your family and, and they don't intervene either. We would call that unlawful imprisonment, I'm pretty sure. And I wonder how you would feel and how you would respond if you felt like you were being unlawfully imprisoned. Namansi and Johnson then also wrote, um, the need for autonomy and independence does not diminish with the deterioration of cognitive abilities. The need that we all have to be independent and self-determined, that does not go away if we develop dementia. So this was a pretty powerful study. Um, how did we get into this mess in the first place? <laughs> um, I really think it was the best of intentions. Again, if we kind of look at the history, and by the way, Maggie Calkins, um, Dr. Maggie Calkins has a great white paper available online. Um, if you Google something like the history of segregation um, in dementia care in the US, um, uh, and Dr. Calkins' name, um, her white paper on the history um, might pop up for you as it did for me. Um, and, and what I learned was that, you know, in the U.S. in 1974, um, they opened the Weiss Pavilion at the Philadelphia Geriatric Center, which is now part of the Abramson Center for Jewish Life. And it was designed by Dr. Um, M. Powell Lawton, and um, who um, was you know, really had the best of intentions here. Um, Dr. Lawton had two goals. Number one, to improve wayfinding because institutional environments were so difficult for people living with dementia to navigate. 
And then he, he really wanted to create more opportunities for spontaneous interaction instead of those dead end, double, or double loaded corridors. Um, he really wanted to create social interaction for people who were living with dementia and better meet their needs than the traditional nursing homes were at that time. So these are really, you know, these are wonderful intentions. And so they designed um, the Weiss Pavilion, 40 resident rooms around a large open pavilion. The intention was not um, locked and segregated memory care, but to really look at how the built environment can support well-being. And if you look at the movement of memory care from the 80s, from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s, um, what we see was the role that architecture and design really played in the proliferation of memory care in the US. Um, so a couple of um, resources were, are here, um, a couple of references. But if you look, it was really about creating a better physical environment. How do we reduce environmental stressors? How do we better support the functional deficits of people living with dementia through um, a, a therapeutic environment? And so um, as we continue to write about designing for dementia, um, and, and as people also started to charge a premium for memory care, um, we, we really started to see um, a number, um, we, we saw the number of memory care communities um, really increase over the years. Um, and, and so today um, it's still one of the fastest growing um, sectors in, in aging services for, in terms of new construction. So, um, so they have, the interesting thing about this is um, memory care um, has only been brought forward in my lifetime. So it's not, this is not something we've been doing forever. It's a relatively new approach to care and support of people living with dementia. And, but people really have the right to live in a restraint-free world. They have the right to live in a restraint-free world. It, it, memory care, it resides on a base of human practice and human history. We made this. We made this. Um, and because we made it, we can unmake it. We can completely unmake this. We have learned valuable things. Um, we've learned so much. Um, really, memory care in some ways has really been an incubator for person and, and relationship-centered approaches. So let's take the positive lessons that we've learned about design, about person and relationship-centered approaches, and now let's use that knowledge everywhere to provide inclusive support to people who are living with dementia. So now let's briefly just look at the case for inclusive living. I wanna share um, five arguments with you today for you to reflect on. Um, after I share each one of these arguments, um, we're gonna take a little bit of time to pause and take a moment for your reflection. And I'm just gonna ask you to consider how well does this argument that I shared with you, how well, how does it sit with you? How does it resonate with you? Um, how do your observations and experiences either support or challenge this argument? So um, five arguments, we'll just spend a couple minutes on each one, but I do wanna pause. And when we pause, after I've presented the argument, I'm gonna invite folks who want to share their reflections in the chat box to go ahead and share your reflections. Again, this is a, this is a judgment-free zone. I hope that we are all in this together, that we're learning together. Um, I'm certainly not an expert on this subject. Um, I am I'm just, I am a learner and I am committed to learning and um, and so thank you um, for playing a role today in being my teachers, as well as I continue to explore this incredibly important topic. So first let's look at the civil rights, human rights argument. Um, I took this quote on the left from the California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform document called Your Right to Leave, Your Right to Leave, which is available in PDF online if you just Google <laughs> Your Right to Leave. Um, and they write, all adults have the right to move freely and choose where they want to live and whether or not to receive health care or care services from somebody. Basically, only a judge has the ability to declare someone incompetent and to take away their right to come and go as they please. And this applies to people living with dementia as well. 
So a lot of people living with dementia um, are really um, advocating um, and, uh, um, about inclusion and they're, they're basing their arguments on something called the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities or the CRPD for short to really frame segregation as an injustice according to the C, um, CRPD, which has not been ratified in the US um, because in the US, um, while I, I think we would all support um, this, the CRPD in the US, we have other laws um, that uphold the rights of people who are um, also living with disabilities, including the US Constitution. And if we just look at the US Constitution, uh, I think we'll, we'll find a, a lot of support that our liberty interests may not be deprived without due process of law. Again, only a judge has the ability to declare someone incompetent. So when I think about my experience as a memory care provider and I think about due process of law and I think about how I welcomed people living with dementia against their will into the communities where I worked, um, I really do ask that question of myself, what right did I have to lock someone in there against their will just because a, a physician maybe has given them a, a diagnosis of dementia? Um, well, what was that diagnosis based upon? Um, was it based on it? a MOCA? Um, was it some kind of comprehensive evaluation? Has somebody actually done the work to look at competency? Has a judge deemed this person incompetent? Um, or I can't, I just, I cringe to think about how many times I welcomed people into my community against their will because a family member thought it was a good idea. Um, so we can also look at key resident rights in skilled nursing and long-term care, rights for respect and dignity, for self-determination, for freedom from abuse, including the mental abuse of being confined, um, freedom from restraints, including environmental restraints, environmental restraints. So in um, resident rights, it, it really just talks about chemical and physical, um, but I, you know, and I'm, I'm curious about that. <laughs> so, um, but, but, Locked doors are another form of restraint. And then, interestingly, if we look at a Supreme Court decision from 1999, Olmstead versus LC, we look at um, that decision ruled um, that medically unjustifiable institutionalization of persons with disabilities constitutes a violation of the ADA. Um, and so it's interesting, I was using that same Supreme Court decision to advocate for memory care a number of years ago, and now I'm, I'm drawing on that same argument to advocate for the inclusion of people living with dementia in communities to get the care and support people want where they want the care and support. So how does this argument, the civil rights, human rights argument sit with you? What observations or experiences um, that you've had either support or challenge this argument? So we'll just take a moment for some reflection here. And feel free to use the chat box. Let's go to the next argument then. The argument that locked doors are a primary cause of distress. And so I was telling you about that Namazi and Johnson study um, in 1992, and they observed um, it, they observed 22 people living with dementia in both locked and unlocked settings. And each person was observed for a total of 50 hours under each condition. And the researchers observed and reported any you know, so-called behaviors that were manifested by these residents 30 minutes after encountering either the locked door or the unlocked exit door. And what they found was that there were a total of 1,503 manifested behaviors under the locked door condition. And under the unlocked condition, the total number of reported behaviors um, was only 412. And so they talk about the dramatic decline of so-called behaviors when the doors are unlocked. Um, some other researchers um, have, have also written about how locked doors are really a primary cause of distress. Um, here's something that was really interesting though, again, going back to that Namazi and Johnson study. Um, they said that among those who were the most eager to exit the unit, 
the experience usually ended when the resident was assured that the door was open and that he or she could just depart. Several residents held the door ajar with one hand and they stepped outside, looked around, and then came back inside. This activity was repeated by residents several times during the morning trials. Once a resident's sense of curiosity was satisfied, i.e. that the resident recognized that he or she was not confined within the unit and was free to go in or out, he or she often chose to remain indoors. So again, locked doors are a primary cause of distress. And I'm gonna ask, how does this argument sit with you? Do you believe it? How do your observations and experiences either support or challenge this argument? Feel free to use the chat box if you want to add any of your reflections. So in summary on this argument, I'll say that people try to escape places when they feel locked in. And also, when we do look at the research on locked doors, a simple summary is that locked doors, they may do more harm than good. So the next argument, the fallacy of homogeneity. So dementia, as we know, it's not a specific disease, rather it's a syndrome. And there's a, a whole collection of signs and symptoms involving cognitive function that can follow many different patterns um, and have many different causes. There's over a hundred plus, plus, plus different diseases or injuries that can result in a dementia syndrome. And within these multiple causes, there's many different levels of ability. There are people with many different amounts of reserve people with very different talents and shortcomings and different cultures and relationships and coping styles, but one kind of living environment and approach to care and support. I love um, in Dr. Al Power's book, um, he calls this fallacy of homogeneity, the greatest misconception in aged care. And here's a picture of Mary. And I think about Mary and how completely different Mary is from my dad. Um, and uh, who's just one other person living with dementia. But we can't make these judgments or assumptions about how, how those people should live. Um, there's, there, this is a very diverse population, and it's really difficult to make generalizations um, of that nature. Furthermore, many communities segregate based on a person's identified stage of dementia. Um, but I think staging is a very suspect way of evaluating and truly understanding people. Uh, the scales that are used in staging are often, you know, very coarse and, and reductionistic and honestly can do little or nothing to capture the intact strengths or personal interests of individuals. And so this leads to the opposite of individualized care and support as people become homogenized. And so um, such scales will often cause us to underestimate a person's capabilities and to create environments that actually restrict opportunities for personal growth. So again, how does this argument, the fallacy of homogeneity, how does it sit with you? What have you observed <laughs> regarding the diversity or likeness of people who are living with dementia? We'll just take a moment again to reflect. Yeah. Thanks, folks, for who are sharing in this box. Yes, yeah, somebody wrote, I feel there's danger in one approach fits all. We punish elders who are safe to go outside without a caregiver. Yeah, we do. Yeah. And again, in part two, we're gonna talk about some of those practical approaches to supporting safety while ensuring autonomy and self-determination. But let's look at the next argument about the evidence or lack thereof, um, the evidence on segregated dementia care. And to be 
um, succinct, this is wonderful, um, that I can just put up a great quote here from Dr. Maggie Calkin's recent um, review. Um, it was uh, published as part of the Alzheimer's Association's Dementia Care Practice Recommendations, where she looked at the topic of segregation versus integration. And, um, and so here's, I think, a, a helpful um, quote from her article that I think kind of provides a great summary. Um, she writes, a recent Cochrane review suggests that there is a lack of evidence for better clinical outcomes, and other studies demonstrate an increased risk of elder-to-elder -elder aggression or mistreatment, and potentially higher antipsychotic use in segregated units. And then some other researchers in a well-designed and controlled study found that there were poorer outcomes for individuals who lived on the segregated living area than for a matched sample of residents who lived in integrated living areas. And so um, in summary, um, what Dr. Calkin says in, in her article, um, which again is a really nice detailed review of all of the research on this subject, says that the evidence is really mixed and inconsistent at best. Basically for any article that she could find um, that would demonstrate superior outcomes, she would find another article that showed worse outcomes. And so there really is not a strong or compelling evidence base on segregated care. And to further complicate this issue, there are no established standards as to what memory care should be. Like, what, what does that even mean? And so organizations can and do create a separate area, and they put a lock on the door, and they call it special care. Um, but there's no benchmark to tell anybody what that really means. In fact, the only feature that's nearly universal across memory care communities is the locked door. And so again, I'm just going to ask you to sit with this argument that, you know, that there's really a lack of evidence on segregated care. Um, how does this argument sit with you and, and your experiences? Are you surprised by the lack of evidence or is it, you know, does it make sense that the case would be extremely mixed and inconsistent? Again, feel free to um, use the chat box for your reflections. I appreciate seeing what people think about these arguments. And uh, thanks to Dr. Al Power, um, these are really our arguments, um, arguments that we're exploring um, as we write this book together on dementia inclusion. So let's look at one more argument then, the demographic argument. So let's say that, um, you know, that yeah, you're not too sure about the, the human rights argument. Yeah, you're not too sure about the fact that locked doors are a primary cause of distress. And let's say that, yeah, you know, you think that, um, that, that we really can kind of lump people living with dementia all together and make generalizations. And, and actually, you're really kind of sold on some of the evidence. Let's say that all that says, yeah, you know, I still think there's a good case for memory care. Well, let's look at the demographic argument because... I, I don't know that it's logistically possible to continue um, this approach. The World Health Organization estimates that there are currently 50 million people um, worldwide living with dementia, with the total number projected to reach 82 million in 2030, just 10 years from now, and 152 million in 2050. You know, so the, the number of people living with dementia in the US is going to pretty much triple. Um, by 2050. And so we can't continue to rely upon locked and segregated living areas for the increasing population of people living with dementia because there simply won't be enough people to, to staff and maintain um, such communities. Um, I, you know, it, it just seems like, like not the most practical approach um, to the increasing number of people who are living with dementia. Plus, um, as Dr. Calkins also points out in her 2018 article, she, she says, you know, beyond the ethics of stigmatization, integration makes sense given the statistics that, you know, 42% of assisted living residents and 61% of nursing home residents 
have moderate to severe cognitive impairments. So the majority of people living with dementia, they're not living in memory care today anyway. So, um, so, it, so the demographic argument is a very interesting argument, um, if none of the other arguments persuaded you. Um, so again, how, how does this argument sit with you and your experiences? How, we, I don't, you know, does it make sense to keep building memory care to keep up with the growing number of people living with dementia? Or is it time that we seek alternative approaches, approaches that are more inclusive um, and life affirming? It's interesting, I, I, I think about these cases for inclusive living and, and, and I think as a, a memory care provider, you know, what are, what are the arguments for memory care which um, I did not present today. Um, but these are the arguments for memory care, um, just based on my own personal experiences. Number one, it's convenient, right? Um, it's convenient. Uh, if you're short staffed or you know, folks aren't very well trained, they don't have the right approach. Um, it's really convenient. Um, nobody can leave because there's a locked door. So there's really no um, recourse for poor care and support. Um, so it's really convenient <laughs> um, to have the locked door. Um, the second argument for memory care is that I think it really provides families with a sense of security. Um, again, these are good people. Um, they're, they're trying to do what's best, what they think is best for a loved one. Um, I'm in that position myself as well. Uh, my dad lives at home um, alone um, with dementia. I understand, um, I absolutely understand um, how memory care might provide folks with a, a sense of security. But what does it do to the sense of security for the people who are locked in memory care? Um, what's the impact on their sense of well being? Um, and then I guess the third argument for memory care is that it's profitable. And so I, I'm not sure that there's a lot of motivation in the field to to create approaches that are more inclusive when providers charge a premium for memory care services. Um, so, so yeah, it's profitable. So it's convenient, it gives families a sense of security, um, and it's profitable. And so maybe those are some of the arguments for memory care. So these are the arguments in summary. Um, and uh, again, in part two on February 12th, I hope you'll come back. Today was really just about critically reflecting and hopefully tapping in to your personal reflections and experiences in memory care and presenting some food for thought about um, the importance of inclusion. And in part two on the 12th, we're gonna consider practical pathways to inclusion. How do we support people living with dementia in living in inclusive communities, whether they're residential um, communities or in the community at large? Um, and we're gonna highlight some practice-based examples from provider communities that are really making strides and leading the way, including um, I get to share some of my latest research from Carol Wood's retirement community, and I'm really excited um, to do that with all of you. And so we have time um, for some Q&A, and, and Susan, I'm gonna, yield the floor back to you. Jennifer, this was fabulous. And I, you know, I've been so um, incredibly impressed with the questions or not questions, many of them are, are comments. And so I don't know how many you've seen in the chat box, but um, it sounds like I would say an overwhelming <laughs> group of folks that are listening today are kind of in your camp, really believing this is kind of what we need to do. And I think, you know, what I'm sitting with right now is, it's, so how do we do this? And um, really looking forward to your, your session next week where we will talk a little bit more about it. But I wanna just encourage folks uh, in this remaining time, if there's a specific question, if you wanna drill down a little more deeply into something that uh, Jennifer has talked about. Um, there was a, a question kind of that came earlier. What platform could we use to combine our forces to implement change? And I don't know if this is something you'll talk about next week, but 
Um, any comments or thoughts, uh, Jennifer, that you might have towards that? Um, I think initially when I think about the power of advocacy, um, the advocacy of people who are living with dementia, um, I think about the, the advocacy of people living with dementia who are a part of the Dementia Alliance International and the global work that they're doing on this issue. I wonder if there is a way to really partner to build a bridge um, with that movement. Um, and uh, because I, 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 you know, because I don't think there's a lot of, there's not too many compelling reasons um, <laughs> among a lot of providers to change the model. And because it it is very profitable, um, I I think that the advocacy work of people living with dementia is really going to be what helps us move the needle and create policy change. And um, that that's my initial thought to that question about platforms. Um, I I would I would love to find a way to really partner with people living with dementia in pursuing. Um, this topic uh and um yeah i think that's where where we're gonna um, be able to make change yeah i like the way you started this with some of your teachers and some of those teachers were those that are experiencing living with dementia not the least of which is your father here's another one though um it says i agree with all that you say and i have seen many people in distress when they can't get out. But as a provider, I grapple with the responsibility given to me by the families and balance it with how I personally feel about people's freedom. Any suggestions as to how I can balance it all and how I can teach care partners? Yeah, I think um, whoever asked that question and, and left that comment, I think they really will enjoy part two um, because we will be really exploring practical pathways and how other providers have um, have been able to balance it. And I'll tell you the area that a lot of providers feel challenged in balancing are the rights of residents without dementia with the rights of people who are living with dementia because um, residents who are not living with dementia say things like, you know, we, what about our rights? We have the right to not have people come into our room, let's say, unannounced. And we have the right to ha have our, our belongings stay safe. And if we have this inclusive community where people living with dementia just, you know, are living next door, then there's increased risk that our rights um, could be violated. And so um, Carol Woods, um, well, I'll be talking about that research. They've done a really great job of really asking that question about how to balance the rights and concerns of everyone involved and that it really is a community-wide approach. And um, and so um, one of the things that um, I love about my work with, with Carol Woods is that that is a community wholeheartedly committed to the idea that no matter the problem, community is the answer. And it's when, when we create those partnerships with family care partners and other residents who maybe are not currently living with dementia and employee care partners, and we all work together to understand and to take an active role in supporting the inclusion of people living with dementia. It can't just be um, the employee care partners that bear this responsibility. It really takes the entire community understanding the risks and working together to support autonomy, self-determination, inclusion. It, it takes the entire community. So it's a great I question. And we'll have a whole hour <laughs> next week to really talk about those practical approaches. I think we could go on and on. I think you have certainly whet my appetite for more, that's for sure, and really given us a, a lot of very thought-provoking uh, things to think about. Um, one last question, and then I'm going to fly through some other slides at the end. How do we encourage staff and families to challenge the status quo? thinking of leaders in memory care? I think um, for me, I think a really good um, starting point is to ask questions. <laughs> I mean, this is why in today's presentation, I, you know, I presented, you know, some food for thought, these, these arguments, and then to ask people about their experiences, because I don't think 
that I'm, I don't think I'm advocating for something we don't all already know. We all already know that locked doors are a cause of distress. We all, we already feel um, just really divided um, in supporting the rights of people when we, you know, lock adults into memory care. Like these are tensions we're, we're living with. I think creating a safe space where people can reflect on these tensions a safe space for critical reflection, a judgment-free space is really important. And to understand that, you know, that we're we're all we all have the best of intentions. <laughs> we're we're all trying our best. Um, and but I and but to also encourage people to lean into the discomfort of the unknown, lean into the discomfort, um, and and to be willing to do the community work necessary to create inclusive communities. Um, because it does take an intention um, to, to cultivate that type of community. Wow, I, that's powerful. And I really truly can't wait till next week. And I like the way you've framed it, the practical pathways. So for everybody that's on today, I, I really do hope that you'll be back next week. And if you know other communities that might um, enjoy listening, to Jennifer's uh, webinar next week, please feel free to direct them to our website. And uh, Jennifer, first of all, thank you so much for um, the work that you're doing and your contributions to be that force that is, uh, and voice that is um, kind of pushing against the status quo. So looking forward to part two. Thank you. Can I just ask Susan, I would love to be able to read the questions and comments. I actually can't see the questions on my screen, but if I just know that I would learn a lot and they could be anonymous. <laughs> um, I just, I would really learn a lot and appreciate the opportunity to learn from the folks who are on the webinar today. So thank you absolutely. for. Yes, for we will get those to you. Yep, absolutely. And you probably heard Jennifer refer very much to Dr. Al Power. Dr. Al Power is going to be kind of our headliner, if you will, in Little Rock, Arkansas for our first ever dementia symposium, Beyond Memory Care, a dementia well-being approach that is May 18 in Little Rock, Arkansas. And we will be able to, uh, if you go to our website, you'll be able to um, get all the information about that. Jennifer just says, whet our appetite for next week's webinar. Memory Care Deconstructed, part two, the practical pathways. Thank you, and Susan. Can, can I offer one last word? I just- Of course. I, I wanted to just let folks know that um, McKnight's uh, Senior Living did just publish an interesting article on the 3rd of February titled, Five Lessons We Five Lessons We've Learned by Not Segregating Memory Care Residents. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's a well worth the read. Um, I'd encourage folks to check that out. That is a good read, and we have certainly put it on our LinkedIn page and our Facebook page, and we, um, we too, resonated very much with the content there. Yeah. So that's, yeah. uh, in fact, when we send some of this out, we'll try to include the link to that article because it's a, a great read. Um, additionally, just let, to let everybody know that we've got some workshops coming up where you can learn more about the greenhouse model eight workshops this year in seven states and two countries. More information on our website. Thank you everybody for your time, your attention, your questions, your comments, and, and for your partnership and kind of pushing against the status quo and, and moving things forward. Looking forward to seeing hopefully most of you next week. Take care, have a wonderful afternoon, and thanks again, Jennifer. Thank you.